équipe. Well, his friends describe him like an animal, a wild boar, or even a, a lion, or even a bull. Others mention the fact that he was a difficult character, that he didn't hide his feelings. He had a temper. He was a bit totalitarian, but at the same time, he was loyal and fun, a bit paternal, if you like, a mix of extremes. It was a real mix. That was Guy Lichier. Dans dans certains dans certains domaines après très paternel et et très sympathique, très social. Donc c'est c'est un composé d'extrêmes Guy Lichier. Je crois qu'il est qu'il est. Yes, a mixture of extremes. This man. Oh, he meets up with Guy Léger, far from the fury and the noise, far from the lights and the news of the media spotlights, far indeed from the criticisms which have often been levelled at him. Far from the glory as well, and far from the joy and pain of each turn of the racetrack. Today Guy Léger is savouring that happiness reserved for men who have throughout their existence lived life to the full, in full passion. Passion, of course, was concentrated in his own French Formula One stable. At the beginning, there was a passion, that of driving in the 1960s. Little money, but enormous faith. Guy Ligier brought his first dream into being, that of being a Formula One driver. To this passion was to be added an immense friendship, the one that linked him to Joe Schlesser, the great French champion of that time. Many were the times like this one in Reims, but the two men shared the champagne of glory. Well, after Joe's death, after the moment when I decided not to race anymore, because Joe's death, it really upset me. I tried to continue the story that we'd live together, but it was impossible. The story as good as this could not stop there. A few notes of happiness as well filled youth. Such deeply shared friendship. The last sips of champagne had suddenly been taken and turned bitter. Well, the gaping gap left because of the absence had to be filled and Ligier, the driver, hung up his helmet. The businessman went to work. His aim? To build racing cars. He wanted them to be French blue and carry the initials JS in memory of Joe Schlesser. Well, the Tour de France automobile, the Mont 24 hours, bound to take him to the summit of Formula One one day. And that was how it all was. Using the experience gained in sports prototypes from 1975, Guy Ligier collected around him men capable of building the kind of machine that could do well in Formula One. Until then, it had been the reserve of the Anglo-Saxons and the Italians. Now the French were in the game. As a French engineer, Gérard Ducourage, who was designed and to preside over the destiny of the project, it was a French engine, a V12 Matra, to propel the first Ligier, the name the JS5. E. Ligier's objective, nothing more or less than to conquer Everest, effectively by winning the Formula One championship. Well, was that a utopian dream? Well, he says, I knew the business well, I knew what I was doing, I knew what it was going to cost me, and I had to get the money together to start. It wasn't mad. On the contrary, it was pretty affordable. For a craftsman builder, like me, it was fabulous. You could build up a winning team with exactly what you wanted, and indeed with relatively limited means. I started with the car in 1975, and 1,800,000 francs. That was the budget in those days. One million eight hundred thousand francs are some swallowed up in a single Grand Prix by a Formula One team today. Well, the car was unveiled on the day. 
on that winter's morning when the truck of the Liger Gitan colours set off from the factory in Vichy. E. Liger was to give himself his last pleasures as a driver on the circuit at Dijon Prenois. The first time the black wavy silhouette of the Liger danced to the rhythm of the corners on the baptism that was a trial. Steered, steered, it was badly balanced, it wasn't at all. And I told everyone I Initialist business began. Security in process five testing potential. It was a progression that was full of surprise. Well, Guy Ligier called me at my home, he says. Jack, you must come down to the Ricard circuit tomorrow morning. I asked him why, and he said, I want you to test the F1. I said, I've just got back from Japan, I've got 12 hours jet lag, but I went anyway. I do remember having said to him, though, why do you want me to come since the car has already been attributed to Jean-Pierre Beltoise? Well, I did the tests on the Ricards on the Thursday and the Friday. I completed a lot that year. It was very sharp, and since the car worked very well, I attacked like a madman. And I, of course, I was faster than Jean-Pierre Beltoise. It was thus Jacques Lafitte who was to be the first driver for Ligier in Formula One. The fury and youth had won over experience. It was under the Brazilian sun that the Ligier Matra made its entrance into the Formula One stage. It was in orders made a fuss of it, a carnival atmosphere. The stars of the time welcomed the new team, belonging to a French craftsman. At the time, Formula One still had a human face, in spite of the high level of professionalism. They were still representatives of the race of gentlemen. The time of apprenticeship had begun for Ligier. The first Grand Prix that did, however, carry forward great expectations. In spite of abandoning during the race, Jacques Lafitte took a magnificent warm-up time in 11th place. Right from the start, the Ligier had made it into the first half of the field. Although in so doing, they had to pay the price of the inevitable tribute to inexperience, mixed up with overflowing enthusiasm. Nonetheless, the results of the first Grand Prix had been encouraging, so much so that the experience of just two Grand Prix in the streets of Long Beach, Jacques Lafitte drove the car at the end of the race for the first time. The reward was an amazing fourth place and the first points for the Blues. For an apprenticeship, it wasn't going badly at all. The car was thus well produced, the Matra engine was competitive, the driver had his place amongst the tenors of Formula One. The Long Beach performance had brushed away the last doubts that Guy Ligier might have had. 
His encouraging results now needed confirmation. Worry moved over from anxiety. Everyone knew that in Formula One, the most difficult thing is to get that first victory. Liget and Lafitte had it in their hands during the Belgian Grand Prix, where, in spite of a pretty rough bump with James Hunt's McLaren, Lafitte and his Liget, with aerodynamics, completed a thundering start to the race. We're third. I can tell you that I would really like this Grand Prix to stop now because if Jacques continues to drive like he's driving and if the car can hold out, we should be well placed. Well, the car held on and Jacques drove with real majesty throughout a memorable Belgian Grand Prix. Everything worked fantastically well and Liget took the first podium of its history. Great demonstration of reliability. Then confirmed fourth place in Sweden and then second in Austria. All their efforts starting to bear fruit. So the work had borne its fruits for the first time in the history of Formula One. A French car equipped with a French engine and driven by a French driver started in pole position on a Grand Prix. The one in Italy, at Monza. As a newcomer who'd hardly arrived on the Formula One circuit, the Ligier was pushing hard at the hard-closed door of the elite. Il Ligier, in any case, was optimistic and seemed to believe it might happen right from the first metres of the race. Jacques Lafitte was not to take the Italian Grand Prix. Never mind. The objectives that Guy Ligier had fixed himself had been achieved beyond his wildest expectations. Several podiums and a pole position were to reward the first season. A few months earlier, Guy Ligier was signed with his eyes closed to achieve that kind of result. Well, the most difficult part started for us because people wanted to, us to confirm everything. But the competitors, for their part, were not sitting back and doing nothing, I can tell you. Well, to confirm his first season in 1977, the Ligier carried the same colours and used the same engineer, Gérard Decourage. The same engine, the Matra, and the same driver, Jacques Le So it only remained for the Blues to make it to the moon and take their first victory. In Formula One, many had gone after such a prize and never made it. Ligier, they made it almost by surprise. One Sunday when neither the team nor the driver nor the boss really expected it. It was in Sweden, eighth time in the warm-ups. Clara to second in the race. Jack was to pick up victory with the ease of an old-timer. Andretti broke down and Lafitte ambushed victory. At the finish, he said that when he went past the P1 panel, he thought it was a mistake. He then realised that it was true, and he just laughed all the way home. Ils m'ont passé premier, tu sais, dans les stands, j'ai dit, ça doit être une, une erreur, quelque chose comme ça. Et puis le deuxième tour, j'ai vu, merde, j'ai dit, bon, ben, si je tombe pas en panne, j'ai gagné. Only two years. Only two years had passed between the moment when Guy Ligier decided to throw himself into this mad adventure and the day when Ligier triumphed in Formula One, carrying Joe Slesher's initials. In 1977, he needed to make more concrete the hopes born of Ligier's first season in Formula One. That was done, done well. Lap record, pole positions, podiums and a victory could already be counted on the Blues' list of achievements. 
1978 season now imposed the most difficult challenge for Ligier to hang the level and stay in contact with the summit. To begin with, everyone hoped they'd do it, now they demanded it. Neither Jacques Lafitte, nor Guy Ligier, nor Matron or Gitan were going to complain. The structure of the team had been built up in the hands of Jacques Lafitte, who'd become a national mascot for Ligier. However, the great competitiveness of the car and the driver, the incredible reliability which meant that they were to finish every race except one, was not going to be sufficient. That year, the Lotus from Colin Chapman's ground effect would have put, alas, for the others, the drivers Andretti and Peterson, out of reach of anyone else. Well, three years after its creation, Guy Ligier turned the first page in the story of his stable. Matra withdraws from Formula One. It was here on the circuit at Monza that the last barks of this fantastic V12, which had greatly contributed to putting Ligier in orbit, were heard. With the arrival of the Ford Cosworth V8, it was with increased ambition that Ligier's second chapter was to start. Two cars instead of one also meant two drivers instead of one. Guy Liget had chosen Patrick de Payet, an ultra-fast driver who was, what's more, very good at preparing the cars. For the first time since the creation of the Liget stable, Jacques Lafitte was going to have to measure himself on a level against a teammate. At the Blues, the notion of internal competition makes its appearance. Guy Liget knows that he's taking a risk. He accepts that, it's up to the drivers to do the same. Well, the first time we tested the car, five laps each, and we improved the times on each lap. Him, me, him and then me again. So worried were we about teammates, each wanting to prove the other that he was the best. Well, after two hours of testing, we got together and said, OK, let's stop, because otherwise we're going to go off. And we stopped because we could see that we were at the same level and we had some hard work to do winning Grand Prix. Well, there were fears that this cohabitation would be explosive. But Jacques and Patrick, intelligent men, behaved as real professionals in a of friendship that was to grow little by little between them. So far from constituting a handicap, this association of two French champions was instead to contribute a formidable drive for the stable. Worked up, Lafitte and De Paye take the first line of the starting grid in the Argentinian Grand Prix. First competition of the season. Well, they gave the Gaucho country a fabulous performance, racing hand in hand and enchanting the Argentine crowd, and rather less their adversaries, left powerless and bemused, all forgotten along the way. Lafitte took it. De Paye finishing fourth. Arriba Ligier. Well, I have to say, it's fantastic. I'm overcome. I'm completely overcome. I just can't speak. Well, a fortnight later in Brazil, Jaco and Patrick once again take the two best times in the warm-ups. In the race, in front of more than 100,000 amazed spectators, driven by two euphoric drivers, the blue cars danced a diabolical samba, and this time nothing was to come and spoil their triumphant march. Lafitte won again, and De Paye didn't let second place slip away. The double was historic. Not only was it the first in the history of French motorsport, but Guy Liget was to admit behind the scenes a tear in his eye it was unhoped for so early in the season. Under the blue Brazilian skies, the Marseillaise was played with a particularly pleasant flavour. From then on, the aristocracy of Formula One 
was to consider the little French stable with respect. <laughs> it's a dream. Pole position, best start, lead throughout the race, the lap record. I'm delighted. Delighted? How could he not be? Full of hope, the adventure suddenly took on the airs of an epic. And when humour is in the chair, it's because happiness is in power. Lafitte and Apeye see life through rose-tinted specks. Henceforth, the Blues are sure of one thing. The potential of the JS11 is enormous. Now every dream is allowed, including the maddest of them all. So it's a case, more than ever, of hard work, keeping their heads down, obstinately, because the season was only just beginning. Everyone conscious of that. The champions who are fighting to win are never miserly with their efforts. At the start of the European season, the Blues are, in any case, the favourites to win the 1979 World Champion Drivers and Manufacturers titles. The team finds out what real pressure is all about, pressure that weighs so heavily on those of whom a great deal is expected. Friends off the track, and although they collaborate perfectly when it's a question of developing their ligiers, Lafitte and Depeye are tough rivals as soon as they're on the track. And it's a question of supremacy, and inevitably, this rivalry sometimes pushes them a bit too far. Guy Ligier was neither the first nor the last in Formula One of stable bosses to find themselves confronted with this kind of problem, with this dilemma. How to demand of two champions that they be the best, yet stay wise in the face of fighting each other for absolute sovereignty. Too much is too much. A bad sign the boss knows begins to move around more and more, a sign with him of great irritation and always a forerunner of terrible anger. At the end of the South African Grand Prix, marked by too much breakage, Lafitte and De Paye are seriously dressed down once they get back in. Absent from Argentina and Brazil, Guy Liget is finally present in Spain for the new victory from one of his cars. This time it's De Paye who takes the big prize. During that year, 1979, the image of the two Ligiers gambling in the lead of the Grand Prix became familiar. Former driver, rowing champion, high-level rugbyman Guy Ligier knew how to find the right words to put his drivers back on the road to success, to halt the excessive rivalry from coming to destroy the dreams that he was building up within the stable. Competition continued in the backgrounds, but the Lafitte and de common sense took the upper hand. After Lafitte's triumphant campaign in South America, De Paye then won his first victory in Spain. It just had to end like that because the Ligier is just so fantastic. Well, that day, although reassured, Guy Ligier still had some enigmatic things to say in the heat of the moment. This is the first time when I'm present, and it's very important to exercise the fates. Exercise the fates when all's going well? Guy Ligier foresee that something would come and break the spell of this euphoric beginning to the season. Exercising the fates, while well, these pictures of Patrick de Paye in the streets of Monaco are the last of the French champion at the wheel of Ligier. The day after the Principality's Grand Prix, in which he finished fifth, the Frenchman broke his legs in a Delta plane accident. Jackie Ix come down to retirement to replace him, but the Belgian driver's immense experience will not be enough. Clearly the Blues have been destabilised. All the development work now lay only on Jacques Lafitte's head. Everyone did what they could, but you didn't have to be a psychic to tell that the link had been broken in the hearts of the Blues. So efficient at the beginning of the day, the Ligiers, little by little, lost their brilliance. It was something of a mystery. Neither the technicians nor the drivers were able to make head nor tail of it. But too late. A Formula One World Championship title can only be won with absolute perfection. We didn't realise that part of the car was becoming deformed and that was affecting the road holding. When we found out, it was in August, just too late. 
Guy Liget was furious. Williams had got away from us. It was too late. What makes these amongst the best pop songs ever recorded? They are electro pop songs. Mega hits with a synthesizer driven energy that makes them instantly recognizable and timeless. can't buy them anymore as singles, but at last these are all available on one collection, called Electro Pop. That's 60 of the best electro hits on four CDs or cassettes, nearly four hours worth. You can't buy electro pop in any shop. You have to order by phone. This means nothing to, me. to get your copy, call now. Insight. To replace Patrick De Vere and Jackie Ix in 1980, Guy Liget called on the young Didier Peroni, a daring driver full of class who just finished his Formula One apprenticeship with Ken Tyrrell, the old sorcerer and great discoverer of talent. Oh, with a driver like that in his side, Jacques Lafitte rediscovered his will to win and gave his all. Well, for his part, despite being full of immense ambition, Didier Peroni proves to be a straight and honest teammate, always ready to collaborate and put the interests of the stable first. The gap left by De Paye seemed to have been filled. The disappointment and bitterness had started to disappear. Well, following Gérard Courage's example, the whole team found faith and hope once again. Guy Liget amongst them. So the Blues went into the 1980 season with high morale despite the increasing menace from the turbo engines that were ultra powerful and now more reliable. The Ligiers with their atmospheric Fords with V8 still hung on in there. And that was shown in South Africa, surrounding Rene Arnoux on the podium. Arnoux the winner in his Renault Elf Turbo, Lafitte and Peroni completed another 100% French podium. The 1980 season was led in great style by the Blues after having snatched third place at Long Beach. Didier Peroni achieved his first victory at the wheel of Elysée. This occasion, the Belgian Grand Prix. Well, that day we watched a terrific duel. A fight that would be the preview of the whole of the rest of the season. From this moment, one of the best, toughest battles ever seen in Formula One began. But opposite the Ligier stable, still only a Formula One craftsman, the financial power of the big dollars were beginning to show their might. The tenacious Englishman Frank Williams to draw the shape of Formula One in the 1990s. For the time being though, it was the Ligiers that were imposing their domination. Following on behind Zolder, emerging from the chaos, it was Didier Peroni who flew off with the very prestigious Monaco Grand Prix. For two hours, Peroni, Reuter and Jones, Lafitte, the fight was a terrific battle in the streets. Sadly for Peroni, the rain came, he made a mistake and you could see the distress on his face. When you're giving 100% and you're first in the last lap of a Grand Prix, you can lose concentration and make a little mistake, and it has huge repercussions. From that moment, as Guy Ligier knew, each victory, each point lost in the Casino of Luck was to weigh heavily in the final countdown. After Monaco came the French Grand Prix. Guy Liget really wanted to believe that it was there, in his own country, in front of his home crowd, that his team would rediscover the path to success. Jacques Lafitte snatches pole position, and it was he too that led the dance for the first three quarters of the race. 
Only three quarters, though. Jones and his Williams win in front of the two Ligiers. Well, Jacques Lafitte says, I started with the wrong tyres. Goodyear had made new, higher tyres. I took the low ones. I would gained a second over everyone in the warm-ups, but we lost. Well, the next round took place in England. Williams' home ground, Guy Ligier, celebrated his 50th birthday there. Well, the front row at Silverstone for the British Grand Prix and my 50th birthday, I believe that's half a century going well. Brands Hatch also on the calendar, and as at Monaco, the Ligiers irresistibly dominating the British Grand Prix. But they were not to win because of punctures. Exasperated with three races lost that should have been won, Guy Ligier cracked, blaming the drivers for everything. In the analysis, it became clear that the new wheel rims chosen for their lightness were entirely responsible for the English defeat. The argument between Guy Ligier and his drivers was pretty stormy. Well, Didier just answered him straight back, said exactly what he thought. Didier stood up to him and said, right on the spot, listen, you're driving us mad. I'm telling you, it's the wheel rims. Just don't start trying to blame us. It's not our fault. In the sport, you say what you think. I've never hidden any of my own thoughts and I'm not going to change. It wasn't that that changed our relationship. They wanted to win, I wanted to win. Victory is a victory. That's life. Yes, that's life, but Jacques Lafitte remembers these moments of great tension with the tranquil wisdom of a man who's lived his life to the full. And there is no doubt that if Didier Peroni was still with us, as impetuous as he was, he would remember them with a great burst of laughter, just like Jacques. He would be amongst Guy Ligier's best friends. It was in this summer of 1980 that the Blues did eventually find success, making the most of the weaknesses of their adversaries. Lafitte took the German Grand Prix. The wheel of chance had turned, but a little bit too late. With the missed occasions from the start of the year, Ligier really had let their chance go. The champagne at Hockenheim had, in truth, a bitter taste to it. During the warm-ups before the German Grand Prix, Patrick de Paye had been killed. De Paye, the super talented, the companion to the end of the road. Patrick, the friend, was no more. From then on, and contrary to the general trend, Guy Ligier insisted for his driver's sake that the car be above all solid, even if this was to the detriment of lightness and performance. Victory, yes, but not at the price of a life. I think that uh, potentially, technically, we had what was needed to win the championship. And as far as the human side of things was concerned as well, I thought we had that because the team was very, very good, very motivated. We were held back a lot by financial problems, particularly mid-season. The beginning of the 1980s, as Guy Ligier had foreseen, was to see the end of an era. Frank Williams was already shouting it loud and strong that without the participation of a big car manufacturer, there was no salvation. Deeply blue as ever, Guy Liget launched an appeal to the French industrialists. He was heard and Talbot, the brand with the prestigious past, which had just risen from the ashes with Peugeot's help, came up in partnership with Liget. On the driver front, Jean-Pierre Jabouillet, Jacques David's brother-in-law, he replaced Didier Peroni. With him, Guy Ligier had the benefit of a very experienced driver and an excellent car preparer. After a difficult start to the season, the Ligiers soon reappeared up at the top. From the start, Lafitte was up there in the fight for the lead of the race. Each one got back to the job in hand. Serenity reigned once again in the team. There was only one question mark. 
had Jean-Pierre Jabouillet completely recovered from the terrible accident that he'd had a few months earlier at the wheel of his Renault. Well, very honestly and very courageously, it was the man himself who was to reply to this worrying question. Sincerely, it's been very difficult, but I have realised that I could be right up there in the action. I could be in the middle of the field, but no longer the JP Jabouillet of before because of my leg. I don't think I have the right to continue, and it's better that I have another operation. So I've decided to retire from competition. So the man who'd undertaken a lot of work for Renault's Formula One Epic slipped naturally into the place of technical director for the stable, a role made to measure for him, Guy Ligier. In any case, he had to cope with the departure of his engineer, Gérard Decourage. At the wheel, Patrick Tambay came to lend a helping hand to Jacques Lafitte. Lafitte, who was working harder than ever, more than ever the master beam of the structure. C'est quoi les rapports qu'il y a là-dedans C'est les mêmes que sur l'autre. Que sur la mienne Ouais. Comment tu la trouves sous virus ou sur virus Tu vois rien Tu peux rien voir, il pleut. C'est sec que toi. Ça sèche plus ou moins. C'est. Ouais. Ouais, ok, fais-le, oui, comme ça sera fait, oui. Mais zéro devant. Ouais, pour voir ce qu'on gagne en vitesse, ouais. Strengthened in his new organisation, reaping the benefit of all the good work at the beginning of the season, Ligier Stable has a new lease of life. At the beginning of the European season, Lafitte lines up five podiums in a row, which means that by mid-season, he's back in position in the race for the title. Well, this improvement was confirmed in a very striking way during the Austrian Grand Prix that Jacques Lafitte won with some efficient complicity from his brother-in-law, Jabouillet. Well, he hides it carefully, but Ligier once again starts to dream about the world title. <laughs> Montreal, Canada, the second last Grand Prix of the season. The sky fell in on our American cousins and it poured freezing rain. An unbelievably dangerous race. Jack revealed himself to be a giant, multiplying the miracles every time he came round the track. Well, his triumph a just rewards for his bravery once again placed Ligier within the reach of the Holy Grail. Las Vegas, gambling for the jackpot. Well, having won the jackpot in Montreal, could Lafitte empty the bank for a second time here? Well, if there was a magic formula, someone would have found it by now. To be world champion, Lafitte had to win, whilst his adversaries, Reutemann and Piquet, had to be off the podium. Ligier looked like world champions, but only for a single lap. Lafitte fought like a devil, but the task was insurmountable. Well, at that moment, though we didn't know it, the best part of this Ligier adventure had been played out. In the years that followed, between the broken agreement with Peugeot, an agreement refused with Honda, and a fallback agreement with Renault, Guy Ligier went through a famous period known as the years of transition, where the results, unfortunately for him, were not great. Well, I like my country. I've tried to play the game for my country and not for the others. The French tricolor is part of my guts, and that's important for me. It's true, Honda offered their engine. Joe Schlesser killed himself in a Honda, and Nakamura had remembered that time because I had sorted it out over Joe's affairs and all the business that Nakamura and Joe had had.
Well, I was the first person whom Honda offered their engine to, it's true. And I refused, because at the time, some influential people made me understand that it was better to compete with a French engine, which I did. And I got it wrong. There you are. Et je l'ai refusé parce que, à l'époque, la France et bon, des gens euh, euh, influents m'ont fait comprendre que qu'il valait mieux courir avec un moteur français. Ce que j'ai fait. Et je me suis planté. Voilà. Si j'avais été sérieux... Had I been serious after the withdrawal of Peugeot and Talbot and Matra, I should have stopped in Formula One. That is clear. Ça, c'est clair. I would have had many fewer problems. But unfortunately, my temperament is such that I wanted to continue and not let everyone go. I believe I made an error. I should have stopped at the time. In 1989, Olivier Guillard, the Ligier driver, just managed to get sixth place in the French Grand Prix. It was the first point marked by the French team in three years. The ever-changing engines, drivers and other problems didn't stop the odd show of brilliance, but it has to be said, the boss hadn't recognised the more modern face of Formula One. Well, today we've entered into an era of excessive technology, advanced research and electronics. That doesn't correspond at all with teams like mine, or in any case like the one that I had. Today, Formula One, it's a bit like NASA. Either you have a research center and lots of money to spend, or you don't. If you have, then okay. If you don't, it's simple. You're out. C'est clair. Alors, où on a un centre de recherche où on a l'argent à dépenser pour, pour ça, euh, où on l'a pas. Si on l'a, ça va. Si on l'a pas, on l'a pas. Ça s'arrête là. At the beginning of the 1990s, Ligier left the Vichy factory and set up at Manicourt, the cradle of French motorsport that had become a technopole, bringing together the recruits, the modern era of French motorsport, if you like. Well, Ligier built an ultra-modern factory like those possessed by Williams, McLaren, Benetton and the other reigning princes of Formula One. In their turn, the Blues had all the necessary advantages to build and develop modern Formula One cars. A wind tunnel, batteries of computers, automatic robots, highly qualified technicians and ultra-specialised engineers. At the same time, Guy Ligier managed to resolve the crucial problem of the engine by obtaining a Renault V10, a real little technological gem. This during the winter of 91-92, the Belgian Thierry Boutsen took a new Ligier, the JS37, the instrument of renewal for its baptism on the track. With his hunting jacket on his back, the boss was getting ready to leave, or so everyone believed. But they didn't know him. Another good idea was trotting around his head. Prost at Ligier. It was unthinkable. But for the old wild boar, just to think about it was enough. Like one day, he just thought that he would one day set up a Formula One stable, and then he made a ham. So the French champion came on board. He was very interested in the affair. It was under Eric Comas helmet that the triple world champion tested the new look Ligier in private. And the first impressions of the professor were sufficient to show that Guy Ligier had well and truly finished up as the victor in this extraordinary challenge to catch this man. Yes, he had to rethink about how he was going to attract such people. I would have liked to have Alan Prost immediately. I couldn't because there were other problems. 
It went very well, but Alain is a friend and he knew the situation at Liger and he did what he had to do. Cross certainly made the team progress. But for his name and his career, it wasn't the right move to be a driver for us at that time. Prost, having decided only to return to competition with the absolute certainty of achieving his fourth world title, Ligier's last mad dream never came about. But if Prost was not to come, Olivier Vanis would not be long in arriving. And with him, the final chapter was written in a certain day in May 1996. An unexpected victory in the most beautiful situation possible, Monaco. At that time, Guy Ligier had already sold his shares. Cyril de Rouve and Flavio Briatore having succeeded at the head of the team but it was definitely a Ligier that won at Monaco 15 years after Jacques Lafitte's victory in Canada a nice story in the form of a final bouquet for the young French driver playing the hero it was something fantastic for me but also for Ligier because it was the French team the blue white and red team it was all interlinked lots of people were very pleased at this victory, even if they had nothing to do with Ligier. To see a French driver win at Monaco with a French car, even if the engine is Japanese, was fantastic for an awful lot of people. It was really great in Monaco. I believe that for a country like France, which has problems placing youngsters in Formula One, I believe that this victory and this team are important. There are lots of young people who are good and fast, and they also need to be given their chance. I think there are some very content people in France, but a 100% French team will no longer be possible. That's not to say, though, that it shouldn't happen. It should. It should happen in France, with French sponsors. Right now, we need a leader, a federator, as I would say. And there's only one in France, that's my opinion. Alain Prost, it's clear. Well, he's the only person who, with his four world titles, his victories, his know-how and enthusiasm, he's the only one to unite people around him to make a great team in France. Apart from Alain Prost, there's no one else. Guy Liget's wishes were answered. It's true, there was only one person who could succeed him and who could not have a better heir. In 1996, the Ligier team seemed to be up for sale. Again, Alain Prost arrived and in 1997, the buyout is made official. The Ligier stable is dead. Long live Prost GP. Well, I believe that I gave the country that I defend and love a lift. We also gave Formula One a lift in France, so I'm responsible for a little something. That's what I retain. Well, the road was long with lots of traps and problems, the pain too sometimes, but it was often beautiful, full of laughs, immense joy, champagne, jokes, happy tables. Well, there were lots of friends, lots of great chaps. Jaco, Patrick, Didier, René, Olivier, Jean-Pierre. They contributed to the writing of a certain French motorsport chapter. It was a great era for the Blues in Formula One. Well, after the team had been bought, Alain Prost arrived, and then he himself had to throw in the towel. All that is very sad. In 2002, there is, of course, Renault, but it's not quite the same thing. With Ligier, with Prost, there was a touch of adventure, that little touch of the French, with their love of the little one, the outsider, the last in the class, the adorable one. Ligier and Prost are no longer there in France. France has lost a favorite Formula One craftsman. <laughs>